Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining the very first webinar co-hosted by Hong Kong Green Finance Association and Global Green Finance Leadership Program. First and foremost, foremost, I hope all of you are safe and sound. I'm Chowni Huang, Vice President and Secretary General of Hong Kong GFA and Head of Sustainable Capital Markets at BNP uh, Paribas Asia Pacific. Today, I'm joined by three distinguished sustainable finance movers and shakers. Uh, Emily Chu, Global Head of Sustainability at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Vivi Patek, ISC Regional Director for East Asia and the Pacific. And Calvin Quack, uh, Senior Environmental Specialist at Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. So in this one hour session, we will do our absolute best uh, to share our views on the role of capital markets in light of the pandemic, in particular to these following questions. Have we overlooked S in the ESG world? How are investors and issuers responding to the COVID crisis and related economic uh, consequences? Is there a green lining to post-COVID recovery? And what kind of lessons we should learn you know, as investors and issuers and, and, and market players um, on you know other systematic issues such as you know climate change so i think it's fair to say you know covid 19 is ex is exposing structural vulnerabilities across social systems and infrastructures around the world um, the rise of label bonds uh, are fixed income instruments uh, with dedicated proceeds towards positive environmental and social change are they leaving to their expectation to bring much needed you know, support to the crisis that we are experiencing. So uh, Tracy, if you can just show the slide that I have put together uh, to, to our attendees, um, that would be great. If you look at the slide, you can see exponential growth uh, in sustainable bond markets, which comp comprises of, of Green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, transition bonds, uh, sustainability link, link bonds, so many labels. But for simplicity, let's just call them sustainable bonds, delivering environmental and social impacts. As of last Friday, you can see the total accumulated issuance of sustainable bonds has reached uh, over 900 billion US dollars equivalent. And total new issuance in 2020 year to day stands at 132 billion. 57% more than the same time last year, which really shows strong demand and supply despite what's going on. But what really struck me the most is the, the huge surge of social bonds in recent months, reflecting the market fast response directing capital to deal with the unprecedented socioeconomic uh, challenges induced by COVID-19. So if you just look at the breakdown, um, social bonds nowadays account for 29% of total new issuance in 2020, compared to only 5% in 2019. There is also a further 20% of offerings that are labeled uh, sustainability bonds, which is basically a mix of green and social uh, projects in terms of use of proceeds. So the proportion of pure green bonds have dropped to 50% in the grand scheme of things. But make no mistake, you know, the market has grown by 57%. So the volume of green bonds remain more or less the same compared to the same time last year. And if you do a quarter by quarter uh, analysis over the last few years, you can see social bonds have raised its profile in multiples, setting records uh, in issuing volume. So take a look at Let's take a closer look. Um, Tracy, if you can go to the next slide uh, for our audience. Um, you can actually see what kind of issue, how much issuance are dedicated to combating you know, COVID-19. So about 29.4 billion of supply has been issued under the ICMA social bond principles or sustainability bond guideline with alignment to the four core components, including dedicated use of proceeds, project selection, valuation, management of proceeds, and reporting. On top of these four core, four core components, uh, external review is very often used. 
So, you know, bonds, for example, uh, from the Italian agency CDP, uh, the World Bank mega issuance as well, you know, IFC, uh, Vivid, you know, later can elaborate a little bit more on the use of proceeds and impact. All issue, you know, social bonds in recent weeks under their pre-existing social bond framework or sustainability bond framework and stated their alignment, you know, with uh, social bond principles and provided detailed information on planned use of proceeds. Um, and on the other hand, you also see about four, over 41 billion of supply linked to pandemic response, uh, including rescue and relief efforts, uh, but without conformating to the ICMA social bond principles. So for example, the Republic of Indonesia issued 4.3 billion US dollars uh, in early April, with, which mentioned part of the proceeds will be used you know, for COVID response uh, efforts. And you also see Republic Austria also issued 7.5 billion euro uh, for COVID-related uh, 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 use as well. So in both format, either ICMA alignment or without ICMA, you see such drastic increase in social bonds uh, primarily led by multi-development banks and government agencies, which have turned to the private sector to finance you know, their coronavirus uh, response. So on this note, I would like to invite Vivid to jump in uh, to share with us IFC's recent you know, issuance of the social bonds, uh, which include the US dollar 1 billion offering and the SEK 3.5 billion offering in mid-March. So Vivid, can you share us you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the thinking behind the social bonds, uh, intended use of proceeds and the expected you know, impacts? Sure. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chauni, and thank you, Tracy, for having me here. So I, I think from our perspective, uh, the SDGs came out in 2016. And prior to that, you had a lot of issuances coming out largely in green bonds. And as you pointed out, the S part of uh, ESG or SDG was very sort of relatively narrow focus, I would say. Uh, so uh, IFC issued its first social bond in 2017. And since then, we've issued almost $2.8 billion, uh, the last one being a few weeks ago, literally. Uh, and uh, the use of proceeds in our case are very clearly defined by ICMA principles. So it has to be related to one of the SDGs and in line with what the ICMA allows. And in our case, a lot of the focus has been on gender. So inclusive finance, uh, women in banking, uh, sometimes social sectors, basically health, education could be part of it. Uh, and in general, it could be communities, the underserved communities who lack basic infrastructure. So, you know, uh, so sometimes it could be directed, uh, well, not much of it, but towards segments of the population who by virtue of being low income are being denied very basic infrastructure. So something that uh, we will direct capital towards them to either create jobs where they live or improve their standard of living. Now, I just want to say something because uh, there's a lot of questions I've been getting over the past few weeks on have the, has the focus from green shifted away? And I just want to say when sustainability, the concept of sustainability came out, it was basically on the premise that it's business as usual. But today I think we need to recognize that sustainability is about retaining jobs. And, and I'll talk about that a little later. So let's sort of bear that in mind that if a SME or a company ceases to exist, there will be no jobs. So maybe, you know, maybe you have to look at broadening the definition of sustainability to include uh, sort of um, uh, not destroying jobs or something on those lines. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Vivid. Uh, I think this is a very important point and the focus on uh, vulnerable groups, uh, MSMEs is so critical. And, and right now, you know, they do have that short term, you know, li li liquidity crunch uh, to maintain, you know, their business, to maintain their livelihood. And you think about these vulnerable groups, when there's no job, there's no, you know, there's hardship. And when there's no job, they go out to seek job. And that's where you actually destroy, you know, the uh, destroy social distancing. So I think these kind of financial, sub timely financial support, you know, to that particular sector is so important uh, for us to, to get out of COVID crisis, you know, sooner than later. Um, thanks so much, Vivek. Um, Emily, 
Um, first of all, uh, congratulate, congratulations to your new job, uh, new post uh, at Morgan Stanley yeah. Investment Management. Um, you know, from the recent social and COVID thematic issuance, we definitely have seen very strong demand from the investor investment community uh, uh, reprioritizing reprioritizing their focus uh, uh, to include you know the social elements and supporting you know those social bonds and COVID bonds. So from your perspective, can you share a little bit about the role of investors responding to COVID pandemic? Do you think social as you know in the ESG mix has been overlooked in the past? And does COVID force investors to re-examine, you know, the, 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 the balance? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chani. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, and uh, thank you, Tracy, for hosting us at the Hong Kong GFA um, for this very important topic and very timely um, topic. So I suppose I, first of all, I'll just spend a couple of minutes maybe addressing your um, question, Chani, around have we ignored the S issues? So generally speaking, to just level set, um, the idea of social issues has always been somewhat more amorphous than environmental issues. It's more difficult to measure them, but that's also because it is uh, dealing with a much broader scope of issues in a way. You're dealing with all of the stakeholders around a company that are not the environment, which is taken care of by the environmental bucket. You're dealing with employee welfare and retention, customer safety and retention and brand value, supply chain, worker transparency and welfare and disruptions, broader community impact, which is obviously very contingent on what type of business you're running. And then also this idea of access to essential goods and services. So the, the range of issues is extremely diverse and broad. And then the metrics for measuring company performance have not been clear in each of these issues. And that's led to somewhat muddled on the whole corporate disclosure and therefore more difficulties as an investor in actually dealing with these issues, which isn't to say that there was no attention and it isn't to say that they were never important. Uh, I think what's happening now is that because of the COVID crisis, it's exposing a lot of the uh, inequalities in access to infrastructure, a lot of the social tensions that are underlying our current economic model some of the issues that the Sustainable De Development Goals are trying to focus our attention to address. COVID has just accelerated and exposed uh, these tensions and these trends. And so it's now throwing into relief the importance of social issues in a way that just makes it very stark. Um, so I wouldn't say that, we never, that investors never looked at it. I'd say that investors have always struggled to do it well. Uh, mm -hmm. And now that we have the COVID crisis, it's just made it um so it's made it so much more obvious how companies need to take care of their workers uh mm -hmm. through rotating furloughs through one-time bonuses of financial relief through stepping in to provide proper health care or health coverage in some way uh in a way that hadn't been appreciated before as being so directly the role of companies or material to their business model it's also thrown into relief uh tensions around inequality of wealth distribution that's particularly expressed through executive behavior. So we're looking at companies that are, um, have exec CEOs or executives that are taking pay cuts or giving up their salary for the rest of the year in recognition of the fact that it's just deeply uncomfortable for a CEO or an executive to continue to take full pay and a full bonus in light of the current circumstances. It just doesn't it doesn't feel right and it doesn't create a, a strong reputation around that company. Um, and this, I suppose, leads to the third area that I think COVID has really uh, brought into, into stark relief for, it, for us, which is how quickly can companies convert in the time of a crisis to actually repurpose factories and, and to manufacture yeah. essential goods? Uh, what can they do to quickly ramp up ventilator production? Um, which are the ones that are best positioned through their long-term investments in R&D to perhaps help with effective cures or other innovations that support uh, the functioning of society under these um, conditions. And so suddenly you have a, a backdrop that makes it easier to see a company that treats its employees well, has an ethical you know, and, and strong leadership from the executive team and which can fulfill essential services is so distinct from a company that um, you know, is not kind of treating employees well or mm. is not helping them 
into transition, executives that are not kind of stepping forward with strong leadership messages or actions at this time and companies that are perhaps price gouging or even looking to take advantage of the situation. Um, so I think on your second uh, question, which was what, what can investors do? Um, it, I think obviously it depends on your asset class, but I think uh, whatever asset class you're in, you're now re-examining your assets in the light of the pandemic. So you're, look, you're looking both at um, companies that might be at risk uh, because their business model you know, assumed foot traffic or it assumed kind of loose social interactions or it assumed travel, right? Um, but then you're also looking um, to encourage companies to be part of the solution. So we're doing that through engagement with companies. Uh, we're doing that recognizing that obviously the immediate crisis needs to be addressed. Companies need to focus on survival. Uh, but in doing so, we're looking to encourage companies that are treat to that um, address some of the issues that I mentioned earlier. So um, are they collaborating to find temporary work for their employees while they're furloughed? We've seen that with an airline in Australia, for example, that collaborated with a very large grocery chain to actually redeploy furloughed employees over the period of the crisis, in contrast to a company, an oil and gas company right now that's actually asking its employees to bid for what type of severance package they'd like to voluntarily take, which we don't think is a very transparent way of dealing with, with employees. Um, we're going to also continue to um, appropriately uh, encourage and support companies to stay focused on their long-term targets. So there's been, I think, some chatter in the market about whether COVID means the death of ESG investing or we don't have money for sustainability now, we just need to survive. And, um, I point everyone on this, on this webinar to a letter that was a statement that was set, sent by international investor groups to the G20 a few weeks ago. Um, the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change is the group uh, that represented the Asian region um, that co-signed this letter. And this letter basically reinforced the that the first priority to governments is to save lives and provide financial relief. But that over the longer term, as we move to, towards economic recovery, Governments need to pay attention to driving efficient, efficiently driving private capital towards investments in the net zero carbon neutral economic transition. So we can't lose sight of these longer term goals. We can't afford to let COVID set us back two years in achieving our carbon neutrality goals, because if we were to let that happen, we're just creating another systemic risk that would expose economies to escalating shocks and you'll see the same repeat of what we've seen but 10 times worse um, and so what we actually what that letter actually states is that we can actually through a green economic recovery stimulate employment and stimulate recovery um, so we're engaging with companies along those themes as well thank you very much emily that's a very you know comprehensive view on uh, the situation we're in how you are examine companies prepare preparedness uh, resilience and agil agility to cope with you know to deal with these kind of challenges so uh, really well put uh, can i turn to calvin um, aiib in its name you know, is infrastructure savvy so what's the implication of the pandemic you know in terms of focus for you guys uh, uh, for either financing or investing can you share some lights um, on this Thanks very much, Chani, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion. Um, I would say that, um, you know, nothing like a crisis to focus hearts and minds in some ways to things which are important. And in the immediate term right now, it's really to try and get and help out with the global effort to deal with the actual shock to the global economy. And it's a self-induced shock in some ways because mm. countries are focused on dealing with the it can, uh, with a medical crisis, which then leads to all kinds of logistical issues which then affects the global economy. So it's a shock that the IMF expects to be as deep as the Great Depression of the 1920s, uh, even bigger than the 2008 global financial crisis. But it's also a crisis that we're not through yet, and a crisis that we're not even sure will end. I was reading this morning that uh, the WHO uh, chief scientist expects this to last maybe four or five years, which really kind of gives you a sense of perspective 
that we're actually still very much in the middle of both a medical and an economic crisis. So when you're kind of faced with those kinds of headwinds for a bank like the AIB, it's very important for us to be flexible and adaptive and listening to what uh, our members and our clients are asking us to help them through this crisis. Uh, I think very key is that we're part of a global international response to deal with this issue, uh, taking the lead of, uh, or taking reference from the statements that were made at an extraordinary meeting of the G20 leaders in May. Uh, so the AIB, uh, which, had, which is designed to really focus on infrastructure, has now uh, decided to focus and lead and help out with uh, an effort to deal with the health crisis. So we have approved a, a COVID recovery facility uh, amounting to 10 billion of financing that can be expect, uh, extended to both the private and public sector to deal with the key issues which our countries and members um, have, uh, have raised to us. And they, and they namely are three main areas. One is funding uh, to help with uh, health infrastructure and mm -hmm. absolutely pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm. Number two is to deal with, to help out with maintaining the productive capacity of the economy. So essentially, we have a situation where we're putting the economy uh, into the refrigerator, right? As we're trying to uh, stop the COVID uh, spread. Uh, but you want to make sure that when it comes out from the refrigerator three months later, that it's still alive. Uh, which is a nice analogy that our vice president at AIB has used several times. And the last aspect is to really also help countries with fiscal and budgetary support, particularly the most vulnerable countries, mm. uh, which um, do not have the ability to tap capital markets compared to developed markets. Uh, so we've seen a, um, a call for help from 20, if not more, of our members to help with these projects. Uh, we're trying to move as fast as we can. We've got several which are proposed, eight or nine, I believe, under this new facility. And we recently just approved uh, uh, $500 million of financing to go into one of these programs in collaboration with the World Bank in, in India. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting to see. I mean, you started this conversation talking much about the funding side of things and the rise of social green bonds. Uh, AIB is on the opposite end of that side, really trying to focus to make sure that we're funding the projects and uh, the programs that will help us get through this crisis. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. I mean, it, as, as, as I said, we're not out of this crisis, but we'll see what we can, have, we can do. Thank you so much, Calvin. Um, that's very interesting to see uh, the, the, the adaptability of AIB, you know, from a very infrastructure based now to uh, uh, put, you know, providing uh, support uh, to, to COVID relief uh, to member countries and areas uh, needed. Um, no doubt, you know, we are in the middle of a health crisis that is unseen before. Um, but I also want to connect, you know, COVID to climate and environment because you know covid crisis and climate and bio biodiversity crisis are deeply connected you know scientists have warned us that warmer climate will lead to more disease and virus outbreak and let's not forget you know our health depends on a healthy planet so you know now in, particularly with some countries who are now um, have been, you know, have COVID more or less uh, slightly under control. We're seeing them talking about uh, recovery stimu stimulus measure uh, for post COVID. So for example, Germany um, used that opportunity uh, to accelerate the shift away from a reliance on carbon uh, for growth. And that could involve support for sectors like renewable energy, uh, electric vehicles, battery storage, you know, recycling plans and affordable energy efficiency, housing, that sort of thing. And in Asia, we saw leadership, you know, from, from Korea um, in terms of post-COVID post reboot. Um, so the president, you know, announced the vision of their Green New Deal, uh, which includes substantial investments, you know, in renewable energy, uh, uh, introduction of the carbon tax and phasing out of domestic and overseas coal financing. Uh, by the public sector institutions. Uh, and they are establishing a regional energy uh, transition center to support workers uh, to, to find jobs in green and sustainable sectors, which is actually very encouraging. 
and Korea also established a medium uh, to uh, to a medium to long term roadmap um, towards achieving net zero carbon emissions uh, by 2050. So can I also go around the circle uh, to see if my panelists uh, can add more color to what you think of the new normal uh, should look like uh, when we when we are getting out of the the the, the woods. Uh, Vivid, um, would you, you know, IFC is deeply involved, you know, in, with the private sectors in emerging markets. How, you know, you talk about SMEs, you know, vulnerable groups. Is, is there a green connection, a green future to those areas that you, you are looking at, focusing on? First, I apologize. Uh, my, my iPad just stopped it over. So if you saw, <laughs> I apologize for that. So, uh, no no, worries. so I, I, I think we clearly see a connection. Uh, and I think this is also a great opportunity. So uh, let me just share with you. So one sector that's been hit is tourism, as we all know. And uh, tourism is a sector that can be greened. So we are talking to some of our clients and providing them with liquidity facilities uh, with the expectation that at least a part of it will go towards uh, greening their existing buildings and their existing hotels. Uh, so these are the kind of conversations we are having with people. Now, uh, I, I think in the past, when we looked at an intervention with a financial institution or almost any institution, we did try and have a green angle. And by way of example, last year in East Asia and the Pacific, we had 48% of our annual commitments were climate friendly or were linked to climate there. Uh, this year, I suspect that number may be a little smaller because what we're doing right now is really seeing how we can provide liquidity support. So phase one to me is really, how do we help SMEs? How do we help companies to stay afloat there? Mm -hmm. And we are hoping to continue this engagement and then deepen it and say, okay, now that y'all are over the hump and y'all are surviving, mm -hmm. let's continue on the path towards greening your facilities. So mm -hmm. one thing that we're very focused on is what we call, how do you transition, the sort of transition bonds we're looking at there. Mm -hmm. So you go and talk to a large real estate chain. So clearly you can convince them that all their new buildings should be green, but they also have an existing stock of old buildings which are not green. So we're trying to convince clients to try and retrofit a large part of their existing uh, real estate portfolios and try and make them green. Um, at the same time, I think when it comes to SMEs, like I said earlier, the first thing, first priority to be honest is to help them stay afloat help them continue to employ people and sort of ensure that jobs are not lost there. And then in the phase two part of it is when we start coming back to the environment and the social aspects and how do we help them uh, move standards? How do we help raise standards to one level higher? Uh, and that's something which I'm quite confident will happen because I think today climate and things like green buildings uh, are no more about a CSR activity it's no more mm -hmm. about to do good. It actually makes very good business sense. Yeah. And, you know, my favorite example is going to a client and they said, well, we don't know green buildings are going to be expensive and this and that. And I have two phones. And I said, this is a green building. This is a, what I call a brown building, which is going to have more value five years from now or three years from mm -hmm. now. And that was a pretty quick discussion and we moved on. So I, I think this to come back is priority one, at least for us is how do we help companies continue to operate and not close down because of liquidity issues. And then we are going to continue on our path towards sustainability. Thanks. Excellent. Emily, would you like to share your perspective on this? Yeah, on whether the recovery will be green. Mm. Um, so I think, I think that there's a couple of points I, I want to make. So first of all, what we've seen so far is, and the, the data is early, but what we've seemed to be observing is that funds or baskets of companies that have strong climate or ESG characteristics seem to be actually slightly outperforming uh, the rest of the market right now. So um, there was another um, prominent sell side research <laughs> group at a bank that uh, did a study that showed that climate stocks, according to their methodology, had outperformed 5% since the beginning mm. of the year and that high ESG stocks had outperformed about 3.5 to 3.7% during the year. So we don't, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like 
COVID is a short-term drag on performance. Obviously, this is in the context of the entire market having precipitously fallen off a ledge, but um, the relative performance is still strong. Um, we've, what we've also seen in the green and social bond market is that um, spreads have tightened a little bit more than they have with your general bonds. And this signals the confidence that investors have in these particular type of, uh, this particular type of credit. So I'm excited about the possibility that over the months to come, that what we will be able to demonstrate and kind of rest, rest to bed this idea that ESG is just for, it's a fair weather friend, it's only for when times are good, it's only for when you can afford it. Um, I think it's, we're having the opportunity here to prove the thesis that actually ESG um, standards and companies that do well in these areas are quality companies to own and that they are longer term, more resilient companies, whether you're looking at stocks or bonds. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that will be the conclusion, but I think it's um, a little bit early to say. Whether the recovery will necessarily be green, I think we as investors, when we're looking at these trends, this gives us confidence that, they will, that it will be a valuable proposition. But whether the economy will actually be green, I think is going to take intention from governments and intention from institutional investors. It won't just happen by itself. We need to make sure the right incentives are in place. Uh, we need to make sure the right um, you know, incentives are built in, not only in terms of all of the green reforms that are underway in, in countries like South Korea or regions like Europe, but there's a, um, that we follow through with you know, various carbon taxes and other things that create the environment for this transition to happen. I think what we have here is an amazing opportunity. We've seen that the pandemic has, has cut uh, oil demand by nearly 30%, uh, causing a crisis in the energy sector. Um, we, we see that we're probably going to have a net reduction in carbon emissions uh, this year, um, an 8% drop, uh, which is huge. It's giving us the opportunity to see what is a clean environment like and how much are we willing to change in order to make that happen. You know, I'm, I, don't, I think that the public consciousness around this is going to be so high coming out of the, uh, coming out of the crisis and as part of the economic recovery it's going to be difficult to justify going back to business as usual when pollution comes back and when, uh, when roads are congested again. You know, we had the, the CEO of BP kind of ruminate in public that he thinks that COVID could potentially precipitate peak oil about, you know, five years earlier than they had originally uh, projected mm. it would be. Um, you know, we've got the International Energy Association uh, stating that all, um, sector, all subsectors in the energy sector are projected to contract this year, except for renewable energy. And interestingly, mm. renewable energy is set to grow. Uh, this is largely because of projects, wind projects that are all, already underway in the US. But again, it just underlines that renewable energy is a good investment because it's a longer term stable uh, investment that isn't subject to energy prices. And particularly in areas where renewable energy may have um, preferential access to the grid. So I think there's an opportunity, but for the, for the recovery to be green, we need to actually be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would say the other opportunity I think we have here is uh, to continue to, to push for more, um, for further evolution of this idea of stakeholder capitalism. You know, it's, it's incredible timing really that just less than a year ago, you had the business round table in the US come out and say, you know, I think around 100 or so companies come out and say, you know, it's not just our shareholders, you know, companies depend on all of our stakeholders being cared for and being healthy. And now we have the test to demonstrate whether that stakeholder capitalism concept is really a genuine one. Um, so I think you'll see that that discourse coming out more and more and possibly influencing ne next year's proxy season in the case of listed equities. Great, thanks, Emily. I, I, I totally agree. And just a few points to, to respond to what you said in terms of our performance, right? I mean, we also found it consistently in times of volatility, you know, you don't even need to go too far back. Just look at last year when you have the US-China trade war tension. Uh, we also saw, you know, green bonds, you know, at least for APAC, you know, the bonds that I look after have outperformed, you know, the conventional non-green 
So you could see, you know, investors stick stickiness on these green bonds uh, do help them in the secondary market. So similarly in today's environment, you know, we do see sustainable bonds, you know, have a better outperformance uh, when you benchmark uh, the green bond index versus, you know, conventional benchmark. So I think this is, it's a particular interesting time to see like, you know, ESG sustainability uh, showing additional value uh, to investors. And to another point to, 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 to add is, you know, the green lining of COVID, you know, we, for those in Hong Kong, I don't know, you have heard, like, people are telling me that they have seen dolphins, you know, in Hong Kong Island. That's, that's incredible, you know, I mean, there's no, no way I would ever thought about dolphins who come to swim, you know, you know, outside IFC or uh, Aberdeen, you know, that, that kind of areas right, where you typically are so congested and busy with, with you know, human uh, in, uh, pollution. So, Calvin, you know, what are your thoughts on, on, on this question? Uh, thanks, Johnny. A lot of, uh, a lot of rich, uh, interesting thoughts. Thanks for that. Um, I, well, first of all, I, I wanted to just uh, also share with you guys that uh, we've also done uh, work looking into the resilience of ESG-linked investments during periods of crisis. And no surprises, we actually found also that ESG-linked investments, both stocks and bonds in developed and developing markets, mm -hmm. were resilient, not just during the COVID crisis, but I was quite interested to find out they were actually quite resilient during the global financial crisis as well. Mm -hmm. Now, many of these ESG-linked uh, indexes were not around back then, so we had to kind of backdate this to see what they would have performed had they been around. But that was quite interesting to me for me to see. Um, I mean, I think my other reflection, I think uh, sort of in response to what Emily said about uh, uh, COVID, uh, really getting people to really focus on the, the fundamental issues that support human life, so to speak, right? The environment and health and so forth, is that we are seeing also this trends globally as well, because I think uh, as Emily has rightly put out, it's not just investors or banks or policymakers which are going to lead us over this, uh, the, this crisis or indeed the, the bigger crisis, some would say, which is the climate crisis. But there's so much more awareness of these issues mm. in the public as well. And you see that uh, of course, it's hard to feel climate change sometimes, but you see that certainly uh, through agents of that, and that could be air pollution, that could be this destruction of the, the forests in many parts of the world and so forth. And I think that there's a rising consciousness of that. Now, I like the, I like the, the, the phrasing that uh, the UNPRI has used, for example, to describe the, the climate, climate, climate change. And they have a program called the inevitable policy response. Mm. You know, I think we are going to see increasingly so much more events, which are tail end risks that the scientists, the climate scientists have been warning us for years. And that's already baked into the next uh, 30 years, the next, uh, next 50 years. So it's a matter of us, uh, investors and banks and so forth, adjusting our portfolios to be, to be more forward looking and to be preparing for ourselves for that. <laughs> Which leads me to, I guess, a little, a little, uh, a little bit of uh, show and tell. We are at AIB right now, very focused on trying to get awareness, not just, of course, not on climate, but also trying to think about ways in which climate can be dimensioned and thought about from an intellectual standpoint. Uh, so I would be happy to, 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 uh, to be directly contacted by anybody who's interested in our work looking at uh, a climate frameworks as, as it relates to markets. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it's not a trade off, you know, between E and S, right, you know, they are interconnected. And governance is something that also glue, you know, both issues without proper governance, proper management, you cannot action on environmental and social uh, challenges. So um, perhaps I'll just pause here. And, and see if we have any questions uh, from our audience. Let me see if I know how to use this <laughs> Q&A. Um, did Tracy send us some questions from the chat? Yes, Chani, so yes, um, look at the- Okay, I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. So. Um, 
we have a question from oh our friend Michael Savatico. Um, my concern is that we dilute the value of green and social bonds by using these terms to quickly fund projects that deal with COVID crisis rather than longer term climate and social issues. How do we ensure the standards of green and social bonds are maintained? So uh, let me take a crack at that because I think I'd alluded to something now, just to mm -hmm. clarify. Uh, that's not what I said. I think it's absolutely critical that we maintain standards yeah? because I think the moment you start diluting standards, uh, you know, you'll have greenwashing and social washing and impact washing and that's it. I think we just have to be honest to ourselves and say, uh, right now, this is where money is needed maybe. And I'm certainly not saying that we should classify a liquidity facility for SMEs as a sustainability facility. One can make that argument, but I don't think we should be changing standards. I think what's urgently needed in the world today is a method or a mechanism to keep these SMEs alive. And mm -hmm. I would say, let's not confuse the two. And also just to add, um, you know, we do see a huge surge of COVID, you know, bonds without using the ICMA social bond principle. Doesn't mean, you know, they are not comply or doesn't mean they do not respect the spirit, you know, of the ICMA principles as well. So particularly if you look at the huge surge of issuance are done by multi-development banks and government agencies, right? So naturally they have a focus on public interest they have a focus on you know, social well-being and, and, and uh, sustainability development in general. So when they issue these bonds, you know, out of, because of crisis, because of time sensitivity, urgency, you know, they would have to be uh, adapted to, to the, the time frame that they have. So not necessarily using referencing ICMA or going through an external reviewer does not make the bond you know, less uh, uh, robust uh, than those focused on uh, uh, complying to ICMA. I think, you know, certainly you uh, as an investor, you should not just take the face value, you know, of those label and look into the level of transparency those issuers are offering. And very often you do find, you know, the uh, issuer elaborating intending use of the C, uh, as well as, you know, potential reporting uh, uh, commitment. So, um, you know, not having ICMA uh, label does not necessarily discount them. Uh, I think that would be, you know, my, my suggestion um, to your question. Uh, another question uh, um, that I want to throw to the, to, to the group, how do we know whether a company is ESG compliant? Emily, would you like to take this one? Sure, yes. So I actually try to, to avoid using this term compliant. Mm. Uh, in the ESG space, because in reality, uh, the sustainability of a company is measured in two ways, I would say, broadly speaking. One is relative to its peer group. So what is the relative strength of the sustainability practices, uh, performance, investments of a company relative to the other companies in that country or in that industry which are available to you as an investor? The other way of looking at it is what is the performance or this, the, the resilience of the company in light of some of the systemic issues like climate change, like um, populism and inequality and like mm -hmm. health crises like the pandemic. So you can have a company that's relatively better than the rest, but if the entire industry is actually at risk uh, or in the entire business model, say the, you know, the Airbnb business model, for example, uh, the gig economy is actually quite at risk right now as of surviving the pandemic. Um, you also have to look at whether that a company is fit for purpose to be part of the new green transitioning economy. Um, and so there isn't a golden set of metrics. I wish that there was. Uh, there are certainly some regulators that are starting to convene to discuss the need for standardized compulsory ESG disclosures. We've seen compulsory ESG disclosures introduced in jurisdictions like Taiwan, Malaysia, uh, mainland China on some areas, uh, or comply or explain obviously in Hong Kong and, and other jurisdictions. Uh, but these 
disclosure requirements have not been coordinated, they're not consistent, um, and they're not, well, they're not global, ultimately. And so there is an increasing interest and realization, I think, among both regulators and investors about the need for standardized disclosure. Now, the dis if you can get standardized quality audited disclosure, you would finally have the building blocks on which you could then start to accurately judge the ESG profile of various companies. Hi, Chani. I, if I could just, uh, yeah. just uh, comment on that as well. I think the other thing that makes uh, that question confusing as well is that I think sometimes we get, we use the word ESG really to talk about ESG compliance as opposed to ESG being, being a performance indicator. So as it relates to the AIB, for example, it's absolutely key that our clients work with us to adhere to an environmental social framework. And that's really much more of a pass-fail kind of dynamic, right? And uh, Emily talked about uh, sort of the metrics for ESG as well. One other metric as well, obviously, is whether things meet social norms or even legal norms as well, right? And then the emerging world of ESG performance indicators uh, which is uh, uh, um, very much more developed, for example, in listed equities and growing in bonds and so on, they are becoming more and more prevalent in real assets, real infrastructure and so on. And then that's where you get into things such as the ISC performance <laughs> standards and, the, mm -hmm. and the other kinds of uh, ways of measuring the impact of real assets. Um, it's an evolving field, but I, what I do sense from, uh, from, from investors and market participants is a great desire for harmonization of all these kinds of standards for a way to actually uh, incentivize the winners and also disincentivize the, the greenwashers. Great. Thank you so much, Emily and Calvin. Uh, I have another question from the audience. Uh, any specific recommendations on how to make government more willing to introduce green elements in the stimulus package and recovery plan? Any taker from the speakers? Yeah, so I'll just share with you something that, uh, in all fairness, it was started before the crisis hit that we're doing in Fiji. Uh, so the government there has asked us to work on a PPP for affordable housing. And we said, great idea, but Fiji, as we know, is very prone to typhoons and climate change. Mm -hmm. So we uh, agreed with the government that we will have a PPP for housing, which is uh, green and also climate resilient. So it can withstand typhoons up to a certain level. And these are the kind of things that we have started conversations with governments. So when they are through, so the first phase, like I said, is liquidity. The second phase would be more rebuilding and sort of, uh, you know, uh, investing in infrastructure, which is a big, a great way to kickstart an economy. And that's where we've already got conversations going on with governments. And I think concrete is yet in all fairness, that their conversations are ongoing to get the governments to invest in sectors, to continue to or increase focus on things like green energy, or when they're going into real estate related projects to ensure that they're uh, compliant with green building standards and things like that. Thank you, Vivek. I'll add to that. Um, I mentioned in my remarks earlier, the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change had been a co-signatory to a letter that went to the G20 that was doing exactly this, encouraging governments to make sure that the recovery was green. I think if you're working for um, a bank or a financial institution, uh, look up that letter, you know, see if you agree with the way it's been termed and phrased. And approach the government to talk to them about it. I think the government needs to hear voices from the investment and the finance community that there is strong interest and uh, belief uh, in this area and that they would like to be supported to continue uh, to grow investments in this space, show some of the financial data, uh, show some of the positive outcomes from investing in this way. And I think that that can help influence. Thank you. Um, we still have time for a couple more questions. Uh, well, I, I'll take one question that is more related to Hong Kong. Let me see. Okay, I found it. Um, appreciate, you know, macro insights. What are the panelists' views of the impact of COVID-19 on financing sustainability in Hong Kong? 
and Greater Bay Area specifically? I guess I, I'll take this question, uh, given that you know uh, I, I, I live here, work here, and 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 represent Hong Kong GFA. Um, you know, just recently we have seen you know major development uh, with the intergovernmental collaboration uh, on sustainable finance. You know, initiated by Hong Kong Monetary Authority and uh, Securities and Futures Commission. Uh, so this is a it's a network of you know major regu finance regulators such as you know those two that I mentioned and insurance authority MPF schemes and uh, environmental bureau joining forces to to look at systematic change uh, uh, in the financial system to better include you know sustainability. So you know we have seen you know recent uh uh very actually even i think very recently just uh, as of today that uh, uh uh you know regulators are now setting up greens assessment framework to establish you know a green baseline in hong kong so i i don't think you know uh covid 19 has slowed down you know the the discussion and action on sustainable finance in Hong Kong. And in fact, COVID-19 is acting as a wake up call for us to better, you know, to, to, to have better perspective uh, in terms of, you know, the uh, material, you know, ESG implication on the banking system, uh, for example, right? You know, right now, banks are making provisions about you know, bad loans as a result of COVID-19. But at the same time, you know, it's also a time for the banking sector to support, you know, uh, uh, SMEs and, and, and communities and economy, economics uh, in Hong Kong and, and Greater Bay, um, you know. So it's also interesting to see, you know, the provision that banks are setting at the same time, you know, the amount of lending uh, that they are also doing. So I think in short, you know, COVID-19 uh, uh, is not some is not negatively impacting sustainability, but in fact, you know, also acting as an opportunity uh, for us to 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 scale up sustainability. So you know, we are not losing the long-term vision, uh, long-term sign when it comes to climate impact on Greater Bay, on Hong Kong, where you know we are exposed to uh, climate. Uh, um, uh, water uh, exposure, uh, you know, uh, extreme weather events. So these risks did not go away um, because of COVID. So uh, the mission remained, you know, the same. Yeah, Chani, if I could just add to that, uh, if you don't mind. I mean, one thing Please. that struck very, one thing that struck me with the response to uh, the COVID crisis is that we saw very quickly that despite uh, sort of sometimes a difficult geopolitical environment globally, we saw uh, uh, financial policymakers really come together to ensure the banking system uh, was in place and that there was continuous uh, support and supply of US dollars, uh, you, especially to countries that borrowed in those in dollars as well. Uh, and the IMF uh, played a key role in this. So I think in some ways, the, the, the key challenge right now, in my view, is trying to understand what's the architecture, not so much about the financial system, but really the architecture of the economies, which may have to readjust to deal, to, to deal with a COVID crisis, right? Again, if this COVID crisis is addressed in six months, that sets us some expectations. But if it takes another five years for us to deal with this, mm -hmm. what does it mean for businesses, schools, supply chains, and all of those things? And I think this is some ways connected to a question that I asked earlier about how we can ask for a green, stimulus plan. Well, it's all about the long term now, given that we mm -hmm. don't know when <laughs> this will end. Mm -hmm. Are you going to put your investments into what potentially could be stranded assets or stranded businesses and, and so forth? Fantastic. Um, do we have time for another question? Maybe very quickly, last question. How will, how will or is the sentiment influenced by COVID different now among institutional investors, retail investors, so on and so forth? Um, I mean, the sentiment around um, sustainable investing or the sentiment generally, mm -hmm. I mean, I think clearly the sentiment um, 
generally speaking, among investors is quite volatile. Mm. Uh, you know, there, there's another question here actually in this list, which is asking about um, how much of the financial market response uh, do we see as delivering systemic and structural change versus crisis management? I would say mm. um, what we're actually seeing right now, at least in the equities market, is dislocation from the kind of physical economic reality. You know, the, the prices are not tied to fundamental value of the companies. I think it's different in the bond market because um, bond investors are much more closely tied to the physical assets, uh, the performance of the, of the assets. Um, so I think that that's a real problem for the kind of the ongoing, I suppose, legitimacy uh, of the stock markets. Um, mm. I think um, that's why I, br I brought up some of my points around stakeholder capitalism, um, the shift to a more stake stakeholder approach to how businesses are run and how economies are managed. Uh, I think it's going to be a hot political topic. In, in a, it'll come out in different ways. It won't necessarily be discussed in those terms, but we will see this uh, come up in, in different ways in different economies um, as they go through different you know, election cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, the sentiment is, I think, frankly, unclear. I think a lot of people are on hold. And what we're seeing in the equity, equities market is kind of a, a different reality from what ordinary people are living in their daily lives right now. Great, fantastic. I think we're doing so well on time and, and, and not overrun and, you know, speakers are beaming, you know, their uh, very honest thoughts uh, uh, to those questions. So if I can just use one more minute of everybody's time, I just want to quickly sum up, you know, what we have talked about uh, in this one hour session. And I think, you know, first of all, Corona outbreak, you know, has put mounting pressure on health, lives, uh, and our global economy. And recent weeks, we have seen a huge surge of uh, social bonds uh, with issuers turned to the market to raise capital uh, to, to, to fund, you know, response, uh, urgent response to, to COVID-19. And, and very recently, uh, I think I shared with some of you, um, uh, you know, yesterday that, you know, we also have seen like uh, um, uh, company raising capital, uh, equity capital, uh, with dedication, you know, to COVID relief effort, you know, that's something I think quite uh, groundbreaking where, you know, even the uh, ECM market equity uh, is also dedicating the user proceed to, you know, uh, areas that are, is urgently uh, needed. And, and uh, on, um, I think we have seen very supportive uh, investor community uh, in reprioritizing their location to social COVID related areas and broadening their uh, investment scope to be more ESG inclusive uh, and, and putting climate and environmental agenda high you know, in the long run. So as you know, we see sustainable finance uh, continue to accelerate, uh, we believe you know, the greater emphasis on uh, sustainab sustainability development will likely, or we hope, you know, be one of the lasting outcomes uh, of co coronavirus. So with that, I want to really thank my speakers, uh, Vivid, Emily, Calvin, uh, for your time and the participants, you know, for, uh, for joining uh, this mind stimulating session. I really learned a lot and a lot uh, for me to, 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 to think, you know, post uh, this session. So I wish all of you good health and keep up your spirit and keep washing those hands. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Bye everyone. Yeah. Bye.